Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Conversation here on FCTV. I'm your co-host, Anjale Scott Price, joined by the wonderful, honorable, fantastic Reverend Will Mebin. We are so excited that you are continuing this journey with us, as every month we bring a new program that discusses race and race relations in our community and different ways that race impacts different groups of people and how we as a community can have honest discussion about those impacts and what we can do about them. So we thank you for continuing this journey with us. We are on episode something or other. It's been quite a few of them and we have quite a few more to go. So this month we are gonna be talking about racism and the LGBTQ plus community. So to get started, I'm going to turn us over to our people on the street and they're gonna be answering the question of, does racism exist in the LGBTQ plus community? Let's hear what they have to say. Yeah, I believe it does in a way, just like it exists in pretty much any any community. Um, <clears throat> but it it feels like it's probably smaller in some way just because of the relation like from minority to minority it's probably a little bit smaller but i believe that it does exist just like the whole concept of um homophobia also exists in, inside of the LG, LG, lgbt community <laughs> first let me begin by saying racism is everywhere uh, and I say that by being a black man born in the south coming to the north New York first of all and going to the gay clubs um, I had to deal with the idea of coming into this club which was 99 percent white going into the club and first of all being checked asked to be patted down asked for ID when I saw other white males going in and they were just giving a pass hi how you doing going in okay go in get ready to go to the bar ask for a drink i wait i wait i wait yes and i found that it was only people of color that had to wait we were served out of plastic cups not a regular glass and we used to ask why was that oh because blacks are aggressive so not only are now we uh are black and gay, we are black and aggressive. Another example is Stonewall. If you know, uh, Stonewall was the great uprising in 69, and but it seems like it was an uprising for the white gay community, not the black and brown gay community. I happen to be a veteran of Stonewall, but if you look at the news, most of you see is the white guys, even uh, the transgender, they are I would say they are discriminated against too. Now, if we look back in history and see the black and brown transgenders were the one that actually really started the Stonewall, but you only see the whites. Um, and it's found that to be a lot of places I've gone to that is like we were overlooked. It seems like the white gay guy had the privilege and it seems it just that's part of the, our history in the uh, United States is we are second class no matter what if we are straight or uh, if we are in the LGBTQ community and it's about time we say enough is enough. Well we've had some interesting discussion happening with our people on the street answering the question does racism exist in the LGBTQ plus community. So we have two panelists with us today that we're very excited to get chatting with. First, I'll introduce Scott Fitzmaurice, who grew up on Cape Cod and is the founder and executive director of We Thrive, the LGBTQ and ally community center serving Cape Cod and the islands. So welcome, Scott. And to begin, could you tell us a little bit about your foundation and, and what you all do? Sure. So uh, We Thrive was formed in 1996 as our original name, the Cape and Islands Gay and Straight Youth Alliance. And we provide support to 15 to 20 Gay Straight Alliance, the Gender Sexuality Alliances uh, throughout the school systems. 
We provide direct support to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, not just in name, but in reality. And we have a weekly drop-in LGBTQ power event, as well as other activities that support uh, building community for the whole LGBTQ community and allies, as well as, um, I think, building um, connections. Awesome. Um, do you all partner with um, other organizations that are on the Cape that don't necessarily gear towards students, or are you all just specifically focused on students in the schools? No, that's a good question. We um, we work with a lot of faith-based organizations too. Uh, I think connecting in with the Welcoming Congregations Coalition, as well as uh, a lot of the Uni Unitarian Fellowships, and also too, I think our work is really about everyone mattering. And, and I think our society is set up so much with an age lens. A lot of times our work crosses different age thresholds that are traditionally separated in our culture because as mammals, as Robert Epstein said in his book, Case Against Adolescence, we all really learn by having an integrated society and interacting with one another. So we, we tend to collaborate with a lot of different organizations. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Well, thanks for being with us today. And um, so we'll, we'll jump in and say, do you have any comments about anything that was said by our people on the street answering the question about does racism exist in the community or any thoughts of your own you want to add? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, for me, it really is about the fact that I think the LGBTQ community is a microcosm of the larger culture. And um, privilege and power and white privilege and all those terms, uh, they, they mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. They make some people bristle, but um, certainly, uh, you know, racism is, is going to be in everywhere in our culture. And, uh, you know, I think as white folks, speaking for myself, we tend to like to feel really good about what we're doing each day and m making positive impact. But in reality, we live in a, a social culture that is incredibly racist and has a long history. So um, I, I would say that the microcosm really reflects the larger culture and also that folks who are LGBTQ, just like any other oppressed group, and to, you tend to, if you're not working on your confidence and your self-esteem, you tend to oppress others. Um, I have been really excited to see how the, the, the unveiling of the gender continuum and people really understanding how gender is really a continuum has helped in a lot of ways to open up um, I think conversation around uh, race. And I find the more that people struggle in their lives in the queer community, the more that they tend to be open and sensitive and aware of other people's experience. Um, but it was really nice to hear people talking about these issues and, um, and making comments and, and being willing to make a statement. So that's how we make progress. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's what this show is all about is having these conversations that maybe wouldn't have been had otherwise and letting people know like, it's okay to talk about these issues. They're very real issues that if we don't discuss them are just gonna to continue to be issues. Maybe by having some conversations and, and talking with each other, we can you know, eradicate some of these issues. So thanks for those thoughts, Scott. Uh, I'd like yeah. to invite Kristen to say a few words. Uh, Kristen Garcia grew up in Falmouth, graduated from Falmouth Academy, so one of our own, and is now in Boston doing marketing and design for We Thrive. So thanks for being with us today, Kristen. Yes, definitely, I'm happy to. So what are your thoughts on if racism exists in the LGBTQ community and, and any thoughts that you want to add to whatever's been said? Yeah, definitely. I think it still does exist, just like in, you know, every other part of the community and um, socially, like Scott mentioned. Um, it brings me back to just thinking about uh, it comes from the events that we create, you know, for ourselves, um, even. It goes back to uh, Boston Pride, which another person in the video had mentioned, where instead of being able to, you know, share resources and sort of work together and talk with each other, um, there was just a disbandment and everything dissolving and folks having to start from, from scratch, you know. Um, you know, it's just these, little things that uh, build up to making things more difficult um, to try to get ahead. Um, and, you know, just trying to uh, think about how we're all relating to one another uh, and even these microaggressions, which people might not even notice, um, but are still there. Right. Yeah, um, Charles mentioned uh, Stonewall back in 1969, which 
admittedly, I'm still learning about, but he mentioned that Stonewall was started with some black and brown people of the of the community, but they're not as recognized. And that that sounded very familiar to other things that we know, other <laughs> other um, advances in, in rights and civil rights that we know black and brown people had a hand in starting and pushing, but aren't always recognized. So I think that's that's a show of it's like you said, just like other factions of our society where the black and brown people, you know, we we will take what they've what they've done, what they've worked on, but not always acknowledge them. So Rev, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, first of all, thank uh, thank you both Scott and uh, Kristen for joining us um, for the conversation about racism in the LGBTQ plus community. And one of the questions I have is something I've thought about for some time is the, it has to do with the tension, or maybe I should pose it in the in the form of a question. So, what sort of tension is there between um, BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and the LGBTQ community? Um, because I have a I have a belief that you can confirm or not that there is some tension, and that some of that has. Um, been manifest in responses to uh, the civil rights uh, efforts uh, in the 60s and 70s, and maybe even more recently in the um, reemergence of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. So, what tension, if any, do you, do either of you see uh, between uh, BIPOC and LGBTQ persons? I love that you asked that question. Um, <clears throat> if you don't mind, I'll, I'll answer. Um, so a couple things. One is that I think there's, uh, you know, in in certain cultures of folks of color, you know, there tend to be hyper masculinity, and sometimes that can be, you know, in in Congress or not working well with a lot of the identity within um, the LGBTQ community. Um, there's also interesting lines I find in so many ways, like if you talk about sort of like African American or Black, um, and even Latino to an extent or Latina. Um, culture and how faith is so significant and fairly conservative faith, a lot of Baptist faith, uh, that aligns so much with the fact that it's like, and it's so important, I think, in um, in communities of color, many communities of color. And then also for LGBTQ folks, a lot of times we sort of roll into our coming out process. Many of us are very involved in, in, in some conservative faith-based movements or Christian-based movements. Um, and some of those are, are positive experiences, some of them aren't, but there's so many parallels about uh, what the communities have in common and the different identities have in common. And of course, there's many overlapping things. Um, so I don't really see it uh, as much as adversarial. I, I, I think I see it in, in ways where we, we, we just have so many common areas where we can work together so much, more, so much better. Um, but, you know, one of the things is that, you know, racism really isn't a thing <laughs> Like so much, I think within the cultures of, of color, it's always about like I think white folks really like we have that that effect and that power in this culture. And when when we're not willing to say I don't know everything, and when we've been conditioned to believe that we have all the answers or that we have to lead all the time, there's just not room or the experience or the, or the opportunity to to listen and to learn and understand and and hear things that are hard to hear. And that's really where it all starts. I think my opportunities to attend different different trainings like um, like white privilege workshops and other workshops, which you know have names that might sound really uncomfortable to people, but they really help me to see things that I didn't see before. So, um, but I want to defer to to you, Kristen, if you have a comment on that. Yeah, um, I think of two things, just thinking about messages that you're receiving generationally within the BIPOC community and also uh, the messaging that you're getting uh, through media, um, where I think is still uh, tough in terms of uh, thinking between the BIPOC community and LGBT folks, um, where that could be still a tension, where folks are still trying to figure out, you know, what does it mean to be LGBTQ plus and, and have this other identity too of, of being BIPOC. Um, 
And I think even within um, BIPOC community, there's there's tension too, um, depending on your culture. Um, and again, what you've learned through family and messaging um, around how we might supposed to be feeling towards um, you know, another race or, you know, sort of the, you know, who has it harder um, in, in that terms? How, how many things can we list of, of um, you know, are you a, a, a black queer uh, woman who, you know, masculine woman who also might, you know, the image is of a bigger person, you know, how many identities can you really add on? <laughs> um, so, for example um but yeah just definitely still tension and again in thinking about how we can see each other in a group working towards the same thing yeah, we yeah I, did you want to say something scott um i just i just i think that you know i mean a lot of times it's sort of the the stereotype that folks who are younger you know are, are further along with issues and such and i think there is some truth to that but it just you know, when you look at the, I guess the, the Black Lives Matter is a you know movement, and and you look at um, you know, some of the recent events that have just shocked us all as far as like um, decisions um, within the courts, uh, and, and you think back to, um, you know, just when people are, are matter or when they are marginalized, when they are relevant or when they're not relevant, and you know, one of the things we do at Thrive is we just try to believe that everyone is relevant. And, um, you know, I think of like in the faith communities, how much of our, how, how much of our, our diff difficulties come from some of the faith circles where, um, you know, are we our body or are we our spirit, you know, and yet, you know, our body is temporary, but our spirit, you know, arguably could live forever, could be forever, you know, and yet does the spirit have gender or the physicality or skin color, or, you know, all those conversations are so fascinating to me. Um, but <clears throat> the part about being relevant and mattering is, you know, what so many of us feel when we are in a group that's smaller and having purpose and an opportunity to contribute, all those things are tied to like life joy. And if people are not denied that, or if they don't have access to it for resources or for anything, then, then they're not able to really fulfill their potential. And I guess what bothers me is that a lot of the, what we see is um, people not really aware that we're not connecting and we're not allowing everyone to sort of come in. So I guess I would really like to see, I would like to see us not as afraid to talk about race and, uh, and division. And I, I don't know how to make that happen, but it's, it's such a wonderful conversation when you can go to a training and you can sit there and listen. And I think for a lot of us that have different levels of privilege, it's, it's a totally different experience to go and just sit being in a training where um, Chris and I have been in trainings before where, um, you know, uh, folks who have more privilege uh, take an opportunity to step back and listen and folks who maybe have less privilege or a different experience um, will maybe do all the talking and it's, it's a totally different way of being, but it's the, it's the way that the work really begins. And so I, I'd love to see some more of that happen. And I think more of that would be helpful when you have uh, facilitators who are well versed in, in how to navigate, especially navigating a, a mixed crowd of, of white folks and you know everyone else. <laughs> so yeah, before I toss it back to um, to Anja, I'll offer this in response to a couple of things you said. Um, and Scott, you've raised the faith, the, the subject or topic of issue of faith a few times in your, your comments. And it just is taking me back to how um, much damage, how much harm, how much hurt has been done by um, some faith traditions and uh, in, in how they uh, see and deal with uh, people who are different, whether they be BIPOC or whether they be LGBTQ+, plus, right? And I'm thinking of going all the way back to slavery, how slave masters used the Bible to uh, justify uh, that inhumanity, right? And uh, 
And I know also that people who are opposed to homosexuals, people who are gay, lesbian, transgender, how they use the Bible also to uh, disparage and to harm and, and uh, dismiss people who are LGBTQ+. Uh, plus. Uh, so yeah, uh, there's a lot of um, harm, again, that's been done by, by religious institutions. Um, and yet, uh, when, when I look at a person who is uh, BIPOC, I can usually tell whether or not they are, you know, African American or maybe Hispanic or, you know, that they're something other than European, right, or of European descent. Uh, but I can't, I, that, that's not clear, right? When I'm looking at a person who may be LGBTQ plus, uh, mm -hmm. and it just makes me realize again, how it all comes down to, and maybe I'm getting ahead to the second question we're going to be hearing and discussing, <laughs> uh, you know, there's just so much injustice in the world. There's just so much uh, wrong that's been done to other human beings by other human beings and um, someone once coined the phrase uh, can't we all just get along you know uh, it's, it's uh, uh, that's the thing that frustrates me but I'm Angie what's on your what's on your heart your mind about this yeah, a lot of um, trans folks tell me that they um, when they do finally find a great therapist um, you know, they usually end up having to train the therapist for like, you know, a few months before they can really benefit that like consistently across the board. And when I talk to therapists who confide in me for advice, uh, they'll say, oh, I've got this new client. And I'll say, tell me, are you listening to them or are they more listening to your questions? So like, oh, no, they're totally training me. I'm like, but aren't they the ones paying? <laughs> so um, it, it's, it's just it's interesting how that is. But, you know, I, I think that what would make this so much easier is for folks who maybe want to learn more to know something they could say when they want to learn more, not like, hi, can you train me <laughs> like while you're going on and making your life. But um, I sometimes say, you know, are there two things you can think of that you might imagine that I might do differently or be more aware of that I could think about? And I like that question because it, it's opening and invites people in. It says, are there things that I might not know about? And, um, and it's specific and it's not open-ended. And at least it gives a chance to start a dialogue because a lot of times we don't know what to say. And I can't, the number of times people have said to me, oh, you know, my, um, my brother is, um, is gay, you know, and, uh, and they'll, they'll drop their voice and such. And it's like, a, just like a, you know, it's a cultural thing because, you know, it's, we don't want everyone to hear it. But, um, and so I'm just like, oh, he's gay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they're like, yeah, yeah, he's gay. And then they're, I know they're comfortable with it being loud. They just think they have to say it quietly, but it, it takes the tension away too. And um, but over the years, we've done trainings in a lot of the schools and uh, all over the Cape. and almost every single person that I've worked with who's like an adult in the community at some point later has reached out to me and said, you know, can I talk to you for a minute? And they've mentioned uh, just uh, something about their family or their life and someone who they care about that they wanted to ask my thoughts on or more than anything else, just be able to say a couple of things. And so I, I feel like all of us are, are blessed by having LGBTQ people in our families and circles. The question is whether or not they feel safe enough to tell us and whether or not we know and we're supportive. So I've got a, a question kind of about that when talking about people of different generations and I think this is for, for either of you, if you've ex, you know, run into someone, there was an event here actually held at St. Barnabas a couple years ago, BC, so before COVID, so only God knows how long ago it actually was. Um, and at this particular event, uh, there were people from the LGBTQ community who were talking about their experiences. And I can't remember what the event was called, but at, at one point, Charles, who is uh, one of our people on the street, mention that when he hears the Q word, which I am still not sure if I feel comfortable saying it because of this, he said to him, it invokes the same anger as the N word, because when he was growing up and, and coming into himself as a gay man, that that was used as a slur against him. And so even though he knows that people have reclaimed that word in the same way that some black people feel that we've reclaimed the N word. And so 
it's okay for us to say it. He said, even he doesn't feel comfortable saying it. And so I don't say it because I know there's at least one person who that will offend. And so I'm wondering, have you all, do you feel that way? Have you experienced that? Do you know anyone who feels strongly about that word as well? I'm, I'm genuinely curious about that. You know, it was 1996 when um, I think it was the Village Voice came out with the very profound cover of the Year of the Queer. And it was so offensive to everybody, including myself. Um, but our, our community has really searched for a word and the gay community was a word we used for a while, but it felt really like it came from a white male privilege perspective and gay. And um, so that was sort of the word that was chosen and many of us have sort of leaned that way, but it's so good that you bring that up. There are many people that are still not comfortable with the word. Um, and as a community, I, I don't know if we'll ever agree on anything, <laughs> let alone even a wallpaper color, let alone uh, <laughs> a name to represent the whole thing. And Kristen? <laughs> Yeah, no, we've definitely had conversations around uh, a lot of language, but queer in general. And, um, you know, I recall doing a training um, with mixed ages and um, during college and older folks bringing that up. And um, depending on who you were, you know, what time you grew up, you know, some folks are saying, hey, it's okay. Like I use this to identify. Um, and while also recognizing that there was a time where no one, you know, you didn't want to hear it. It was a slur. It, it was all of that. So um, I think, again, it's one of those words where uh, it really depends on on who you are and how you identify and what you're comfortable with. Um, but I think it's also good, you know, to know um, that there are some folks who who still um, might not want to to hear that word. And again, on agreeing on words to to sort of identify as, yeah, I don't think we're gonna um, ever agree on on any of those either. I like what you and, said. And new ones keep coming up, you know. So right. Anshali, I love what you said about um, that, you know, he really just didn't feel comfortable with that word. And so, you know, it's it's a word that comes from, you know, a history that, you know, is, is something that we have to recognize. But I think that for folks to be able to self-identify, when the word first started being used, it was really just within the community. Like, even our allies wouldn't usually use it because they knew it was a little too close for comfort. Um, and uh, so, again, relating to the N-word, uh, same sort of thing very similar as you mentioned. Um, but then uh, it, it sort of got to a point where now, like if people are really culturally confident and they're close allies and they're really within the community in a lot of ways, even if they're not LGBTQ identified and they use that word, it feels really comfortable to me. If somebody uses it who is really not LGBTQ competent and they're talking about the community, it still feels a little odd. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just my, my experience. So I can relate to Charles, who is a great person, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like it's a lot about context and personal, uh, personal feeling. And, and for me having, I don't, I honestly can't recall if I had ever said it before in, in some sort of context, but hearing Charles say that, I felt like that's not my word to reclaim. And so I'm just not going to use it. Like there's, if someone tells me this is how I identify and for some reason I have to repeat it back to them, I feel like that would be a different situation, but I've just decided mm. not to, not to use it in my vocabulary, just, just to be on the safe side. Well, they didn't tell us you were going to have the tough questions on this show. We thought it was going to ask you. That's a good question. It really is. Well, let me let me make it a little tougher. So, uh, Kristen, are you okay using queer? Do you use that in your language, your vocabulary? Uh, I realized in answering the question that I did say the word, <laughs> uh, and I I do identify like I'll either say gay or queer um, because I feel like other words don't necessarily embody um, who I am. Who you are, yeah, and. Right. Um, yeah, I think yeah. the greater community that I that I surround myself with, um, you know, uses that as well. Um, but again, just in terms of you know, sort of looking out for how are people using it, um, you know, and I, I think that makes a difference. So, and Scott, yeah. I think I heard in your your response that uh, you've had a bit of a transformation yourself. Uh, so, how about your comfort level in using that in your conversations with people? Yeah. 
I love it because I get tired easily. So I don't want to waste too many words and it's nice and short. <laughs> it also includes so many people, um, you know, the, the queer umbrella, if you will, it includes a lot of things. It can, it can sort of include allies that are really tight allies. It includes people who may be identifying differently some days than others. You know, some folks, they may present their gender differently on different, at different times, um, which is just part of who they are. And so it includes all that. It doesn't, I think as Kristen said, doesn't require them to be really specific at a certain time. And also too, a lot of folks, you know, I always say that there's no such thing as questioning. I find that, you know, for the most part, most people usually have a sense of where they're at. They're just deciding how open and honest and, and how candid they can be about who they are or if that will have repercussions. Um, and so I just thought there's a lot to think about. But um, one, one thing I did want to talk about a little bit is just that like within the gay male community, there's like a, a little bit of um, racism around, um, around being Asian or I think being a person who is Black, specifically or African-American. Um, some of the cultural stuff um, around communities being a little separate. It's also really hard for me when I went down to, you know, just DC, which isn't very far. And, uh, you know, being at, um, you know, at party events over the years or dance events and just hearing comments out of people that I would never hear in Massachusetts um, within the gay community. And, um, you know, being in a group of five people and hearing someone make a comment and not hear and hearing no one say anything and just being like, really just caught completely off guard. Um, and so I think part of it might be regional. I don't know much about that. I've only had a small number of experiences like that, but it was unsettling for me. And, and maybe I live in a bubble where like I do this work and I'm around a lot of different people all the time, but I, I think the idea, we do. <laughs> yeah, I think we do. But the fact yes. that people actually think that way, that it wasn't just a comment. It was, I'm like, wow, like this is really like, if that's what they're showing me, then then people are really sure they really show you who they are, you know. So that that bothers me. And the Asian thing is a whole weird energy around it's around body stuff and it um you know whether Asian folks are especially like gay men are, are more feminine in some ways or um different body like details and stuff it's, it's so weird and and so it creates a mini chasm in the community and my friends who are Asian and are male identified and is gay in the community do feel isolated sometimes and um I'm not comfortable with that you know it's just something that's a reality Yeah. Wow. Thank you. So taking us back to um, maybe before we go to our next question, uh, just bringing us back to the whole issue question of how racism manifests itself in the LGBTQ plus community. I was thinking about back in the 80s and uh, when the AIDS crisis was, AIDS was becoming a crisis. It was a, a mm -hmm. pandemic and uh, how different communities were reacting to that. And I know in the, in the black community, uh, I actually joined an organization called AIDS Interfaith Network mm. uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. And we were trying to get black churches to uh, treat black men and women with dignity um, and not stereotypically and, and what have you, uh, who were HIV positive or dealing with, uh, dealing with AIDS. And that was really hard, hard work. The churches just uh, didn't want to deal with it, uh, wanted to, you know, let them burn in hell was sort of the attitude of a lot of black churches at the time. Um, and I know that was also true with, with white churches. But I also remember during that time how um, there seemed to be, society seemed to um, see a person that was black with AIDS differently from how they saw a person who was white with AIDS. And I wonder, Scott, in particular, because uh, I think you might be a little older than Kristen, I'm going to ask you. Uh, <laughs> did, did, do you remember that at all? Do you have any recollection of that? And I mean, yeah, I'm wondering if what you're alluding to is sort of that whole crazy thing from the 80s where, um, you know, there was the perception that people who were sick, you know, had brought it upon themselves. And, and you know, the whole thing under some of our conservative political years where, um, where folks were, uh, you know, 
penalized differently in our criminal justice system based on the form of the drug, not just the drug, you know, whether it was a powder-based drug or whether it was a rock-based drug, how that changed people's entire lives. And, you know, and, and there was this whole thing about people being unclean or, or dirty. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when HIV happened, you know, it, it was a, a situation where people had just become comfortable, like coming out, accepting your sexuality, being brave, and then being told that you gay people were the, were the only ones that could get HIV. And for years, even when I was coming out in the eighties, uh, it was clear that uh, I had to be careful if I was going to be physical with someone, but my other friends probably didn't that were, were not gay identified and they'd probably be okay. And that was sort of the messaging. And it was accurate at the time, actually, because it was more in the LGBTQ community. Um, but yeah, I, what else could, would you say about that, um, Reverend Will? Yeah, I, well, I'm remembering when Ryan White, right, was came, oh, uh, right. it was right. announced that he, this young uh, a boy, I think a teenager, I can't remember his age. In a sense, right. Right. He, when he, he, it was announced uh, or came out that he was, had AIDS. That shifted. That was a shift in right. the whole world, in the whole society, at least in the United States, right? And yeah. people who had seen um, people with AIDS as unclean and, you know, they brought it on themselves and what have you. Uh, there was a trans transformation in some people's minds. But that didn't happen with Black folks, as I recall. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, I just I was just thinking about how um, at that time, and this would be a bit of a tangent, um, you know, we talk about racism, and this brings, right back, brings us right back to that. And, you know, whether people are valued, whether human beings are valued, and that's exactly what you're alluding to. And it's, I don't think there's a lot that was said about that at the time, but there was definitely this sense that, you know, the more, um, more levels of co-identity you had, like the more points you were off in the game, you know? And, um, I, but I think so much, this just, this conversation can't happen without talking about sort of the sexism within the, the LGBTQ community. And, and if you look at um, in 1979, 1980, 1984, people don't know that, a lot of people don't know today that it was the, it was the lesbian women who, who came forward and who, who held our hands and who stayed with us when we were dying. People wouldn't even go into the wards where people were sick from HIV first, you know, and the problem with HIV is of course they called it grid first, which was the only problem because they called it gay related immunodeficiency and that, that set the whole path for it. If they had not done that, um, it, you know, in the naivete or maybe not naivete, it, it would have been really different. But, you know, as queer folks, we always have to be leaders. We have never been followers. And we know a thing or two about surviving a pandemic. As my friend Melissa Weidman uh, quoted with me once, I was like, I love that girl. I'm going to use that. Um, and so so today, you know, we at Thrive, we're, we're open. We're having meetings every week. We are not curbing our programs. We made a commitment in the middle of August that we were going to ride this and we were going to be accurate and be based on the science and figure out what we need to do so people are not isolated. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in a fellowship in Falmouth that hasn't been meeting at all. And uh, I feel like the, the damage being done to the seniors who are so isolated that the memory loss, like a lot of the isolation. So to me, it's it's really about, you know, Anjali and, and Reverend Will, about pulling us all in and, and having us all get connected, but but trying to break down this 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 division and stuff. Kristen, why don't you jump in? I'm speaking too much. No, I uh, I think you all said it. <laughs> you know, I mean, of course, I was still a child <laughs> when you know in the '80s when this was um, ramping up. Um, and I mean, even now, right, where I work, um, we, we work with people who are living with HIV and AIDS. And even now, you know, there's a divide of like, okay, well, you know, how did you get it? And, you know, there was this, you know, gay community and now there's uh, other communities, you know, with um, substance use uh, that has risen dramatically. Um, and sort of the, you know, how the community works out between those two groups. Um, and then you bring race into it and then it's, yeah, <laughs> it's a whole, whole thing. Um, but we have a nice little community over here, so it works out. 
Yeah. Wow. Incredible conversation. I'm, I'm learning so much. Thank you both. <laughs> I think, I think it's a good segue into our, our next question of how can racism in the LGBTQ plus community be eradicated? So let's go hear from our people on the street what they had to say, and we'll come back and continue this conversation. It would be hard. Going back into our history, and again, I said, first of all, we have to look at our society and whole. It's a black and white and it still seems that we are uh, living under the black uh, the white rule as uh the black and brown we have decided we want to fight um but we need the white allies to come giving a perfect example why sometimes i say yes and no uh we look at boston pride there's no longer boston pride because the lgbt uh black brown queer, uh, one representation in the pride. So instead of saying, okay, we are going to open for our input more, they decided to disband it all together. So whenever we're saying, can it be eradicated? It would take a lot, and we need a lot of white allies to come up and give us that support. Otherwise, as black and brown LGBTQ individuals, I, think, I don't think it would ever happen. So I guess one way to eradicate or at least like reduce it considerably would be um, just thinking of everyone as equal. Um, I know that usually the per the person who who is racist and who is um, pursuing that prejudice is gonna is not gonna think of as everyone as equal. But uh, if they did, it would probably make everything smaller. Um, <clears throat> I kind of believe in, in the in this thing that we're kind of one in a way. So wherever the concept the concept of me ends, the concept of you starts, and vice versa. So having that idea, I think it makes it easier to avoid um, racism. Welcome back from here and our people on the street answering the question. How can racism in the LGBTQ plus community be eradicated? So I'm gonna to toss it over to Kristen to hear your thoughts on that question. All right, how much time do we have today? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's great. Uh, in being brief, uh, no. it, it just reminds me in the larger community, um, of how we can all come together. It's just uh, a lot around seeing, seeing each other as oneself. Um, just being like, we are all people um, in this together and um, we're all struggling <laughs> and um, to, to different degrees and um, we're all human in a way that um, we can also support each other. And so just seeing the humanity in, in, one, in one another where I think sometimes we lose that, um, especially in, in the fast pace that we, that we might be um, going at. And, um, you know, even in thinking about um, the events that we have for each other, the things that we do uh, for each community, you know, there are ways where like, oh, you know, this is open to everyone. And so everyone might join, you know, in the LGBT community and yet still feel, still somehow feel unwelcome. And folks will go, oh, I wonder, I wonder why that was, you know? And so uh, asking the question is like, you might say, um, you know, we, we are doing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, <laughs> you know, and, but it's not really trickling down to the actual experience for, for everyone um, at yeah. the place. So I think it's similar where, you know, if we're, you know, doing work within the community, you know, you, you can say one thing, but um, if it's not translating uh, to the whole group, then, you know, sort of asking the question, 
um, of ourselves um, and doing our own homework around, okay, how can we make this better? How can we improve this um, so that it actually um, makes a difference? Yeah, one thing that Jen said, the phrase that I really like is, where I end, you begin. And I just thought that was a, such a simple yet beautiful statement that really speaks to what you just said, Kristen, about we're all in this together. And if I look at you as an extension of me, and I look at me as an extension of you, it's, it's even better than treat someone else how you want to be treated. It's, it's treat yourself how you want to be treated. And if we really take that to heart, you know, whether that's looking at myself, not me, but saying a person who looks at themselves as a member of the LGBTQ community and reaching out and using that as the connection to somebody else who may, may have a different skin tone, that, that could really make a difference. What are you thinking, Scott? I think you got a lot to say. It's beautiful. <laughs> that was just great. No, really. Um, I mean, I, I've done some trainings before where I, I always run in my mind how to do trainings in a way that's really different. And uh, I've sat in meetings so many times when, you know, I'll listen and, uh, you know, someone who might be identified as a woman will, will make a comment, a really good idea. And then we'll move forward in the meeting. And then there'll be someone identified as a man who will say the same idea. And, and then not realizing they picked it up earlier from the woman. And, and then everyone's like, wow, that's a great idea. And, and so I just say, um, you know, oh, um, you know, Patricia, that was, that, yeah, that was your idea from earlier. And I love that you brought it up, John, you know, because, you know, I think facilitating that is really important. Like, I think that, you know, we have to be able to do that. Um, I love the piece about, you know, us all being one. And so I always love it when I, someone's really driving me crazy or making my life miserable. And I'm like, they are me, <laughs> you know, that, that if we're really all one, and we really want to talk about some Eastern, you know, thinking, then, then arguably, um, you know, we are all one. And of course, there's this great book, A Radical Forgiveness by Colin Tippin. It's just, I recommend anybody read it because it's all about the idea that um, that which comes to you that's hardest is not only what you asked for, what you requested prior to this experience in some level, but it's about how you can um, really realize that that's, that's the gift, you know, that, that really is a gift. But, um, you know, the idea of, um, for us, I think, become really different as far as how we see each other is us and them. It's really critical. I think some of the trainings that I've done have workshops that I've worked on creating are, are that are different are about when you communicate, but you don't have, you're not communicating with your awareness of the identity. So when you, it's cool stuff. So when you're in a workshop, but maybe you're reading other statements and valuing the statements without having first seen like who said those statements. So some of that, but there's some higher stuff where you can communicate through a screen with someone that you may not even know. And maybe there are voice changes up, you know, and you could talk to someone for a really long time and not know their identities and, and letting people sit with us experience for half an hour or an hour or working with someone for a whole weekend and not knowing what they look like, not realizing if they are, you know, have a disability or if they're a person of color or, um, or if they voted for Trump or they voted for Biden or, you know, any of those differences. And all of a sudden you realize, like, I cannot believe how much we had in common. And that I think brings us back to that piece of when we don't have that um, initial judgment or, or experience of having a sense of who they are, we, we don't bring those suitcases with us, you know? So I, I think more of that is really important, but also our groups, we meet separately a lot of times. We have to stop that. We gotta figure out how we can you know, bring people up. One of the things we do at Thrive is we have an 80-20 rule. So for folks that don't have all those easy access to our building and all those resources, we spend 80% of our time and energy outreaching to the seven priority identities that we want to focus on more to make sure people come in here. That includes trans youth, youth of color, folks with inconsistent housing. We don't use the term homeless um, because homeless is like a label. Inconsistent housing is something you have or don't have. Um, um, we also have folks with disabilities, people who come from conservative faith-based households, and there's two or three others. But, um, but when we do that, we have a really rich, diverse organization. And so often people in the Cape say to me, how do we get people of color to come to our meetings. And, you know, I, I say, you know, well, 
it's a lot about doing the offset. And, and just like, if I want a trans person to come to a meeting at Thrive, I, I know they have to deal with safe travel. I know that they make 64 cents in the dollar on average. I know they have less resources sometimes. So we have to take all that stuff into, into consideration, you know? That's a very, very good point about the reaching out and thinking about all of these things. That is, I do a lot of diversity work in Falmouth and the most frustrating thing I hear, especially in the marine and ocean sciences community is well, we just don't know where to find the black and brown marine scientists. I know, I know. I mean, I won't get started on that today because- I'll go there. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna Let go there. See. I'm gonna check under the desk. I'll be right back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know. it's like- it's and like, it's well intended. It's well intended, and it's a first step. Um, but just like when we have conversations at the Unitarian Fellowship of Falmouth, and people say, you know, we really want to become more diverse fellowship, and you look around, and we are white, like hardcore white. And and I'm like, we need to get the hottest Brazilian band in here on a Friday night, and have food, and offer free childcare on Saturdays for four hours, and this place will rock. But it's got to be completely different from how we currently see things. We have to be brave and people like to do what they're doing because it's familiar, it's comfortable. I have to really change that, I think. Yeah, and it, and it has to be intentional. Like you have to think about the communities that you want to reach and that you want to serve and what what do they need? What would, what would want to bring them in? Um, before we started this episode, Kristen, we were talking about a, a group that you're in, involved with or maybe a part of up in Boston. And I think you said it was... Um, gay women of color or some, something along those lines? I'm oh, uh, queer women of color and friends. Boston, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, can you tell us a little bit about that group and maybe ways that your group interfaces with um, groups that are not specifically for people of color? Sure. So this was 12, 13, 14 years ago where when I was first moving to Boston, having no friends, I'm like, all right, <laughs> where can I go? And my roommate at the time was like, oh, I volunteer with Quok, which right, the acronym. And so I decided to do that. And um, that's just this amazing group of um, people of color and then women of color. Um, and we did a lot of uh, social events, um, just sort of, uh, for ourselves, just in different parts of the um, of the community, sort of to kind of reach out to different areas, um, and you really got to have a sense of community because sometimes, especially when we're older, out of school, out of whatever, you're like, hmm, how do we meet other people? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, there's my job, and walking down the street in the neighborhood, I don't know. <laughs> Um, and again, right. And thinking about if I still lived on the Cape, I think about that often where it's like, you know, wh where would I go? What would I do? Cause now, you know, being in the city, you know, I can take the train, I can do this, I could do that. Um, so there's a difference there. Um, and then, so that was sort of a, a sacred, <laughs> um, group and, you know, years after you know it's sort of morphed into something else uh, more of a media presence now that group and then there have been other people who have tried to start similar groups or have their own um, promoter uh, promotion groups um, doing events in the city so it's kind of trying to follow who's doing what on what night you know because uh, that's really all, all we get um, is you know one Thursday night here or uh, first Fridays here um, meanwhile, you know, there are groups who um, might be more predominantly white um, putting on events and, you know, still we're around gay people, um, but again, it's different. Um, and so just trying to either work together or say, hey, you seem to be getting a lot of great venues. <laughs> uh, how can we work together to sort of do that? Because some venues wouldn't, um, be as uh, friendly or welcoming to, you know, the people of color, for example, so. Yeah, Charles mentioned in his comments that the need of white allies for support and that kind of support sounds right. Offering the space or the opportunities that the white people know or they might not even realize that they're getting that are not being uh, 
complementary to the people of color, to the other groups. And so that's a really good example of, you know, if your organizations or the organizations that, that you're aware of that are for people of color are looking for spaces and they can't get into certain spaces, that's an opportunity for a white ally to say, here's, I know of this space, let me help you get into this space or let me take a step back and provide you with the platform that, that I have. What yeah, it, go, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, it makes me think too, lastly, just around like the access to information. Uh, if you were thinking about, let's say social media and Facebook, I know Facebook isn't necessarily the most popular uh, thing for the young folks now, but um, I talk with my friends a lot about, oh, what's the, what do you see on your feed? Like, and what do I see on mine? Where it's drastically different. We might be interested in the same things, but just because we have different friends and you know the whole algorithms of who you see and what you see, um, you're not necessarily getting the the same information. Whereas, like, oh, I know all these events, and ooh, during all these crises, the articles that I see and the things that I'm inundated with, um, I see all that, but then she doesn't, you know. So I think trying to reach out to people who might not have um, either the same ideas as you, just trying to sort of widen your circle so you're, you're taking in more um, uh, information that, that's different than, than what you normally have. So. Yeah, get, out, get outside of your bubble, for sure. Right. Go ahead, Rev. Well, uh, what did Kristen say? How much time do I have? You know, now my, my, I've got so many things going through my, my mind. <laughs> uh, well, I'll start with this. So the people who are regular viewers of the conversation here on FCTV will perhaps remember my sh sharing and saying and advocating for um, not so many more allies, uh, but more accomplices, you know, and for me, there's a difference, right? You can be an ally and say, yeah, I'm with you and kind of cheer you on. But what we need are accomplices, people who will, as you were talking, Kristen, about you know, the space thing, people who will say, hey, I've got a space or I know how to get a space and I'm going to work to to make sure your group, your organization is able to use that that space. And uh, uh, so I just want to advocate again for um, you know, all of these social justice issues. Uh, right. Yes, we all we, we need allies, but we really need some accomplices, some people to stand there with us, shoulder to shoulder, and take some of the risk associated. Right. Because as an ally, you don't really have to take a lot of risk, <laughs> right? You know, but if you're going to be an accomplice, it takes some risk. Okay, so I'll just say that. Um, you know, this whole question of how do we eradicate the racism in the LGBT to LGBTQ plus community? Um, you know, it, 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 it's like so many other subjects we have on, on the conversation, so many discussions we have on this show, uh, and it comes down to humanity. I love the conversation, the discussion you all were having about, uh, you know, seeing one another as, uh, you know, when I see you, uh, uh, when I see me, I see you, and you, when you see me, you see you, and and that reminds me of a, a philosophy in Africa uh, and that has uh, made its way to the United States in the last so 15, 20 years or so, called Ubuntu, Ubuntu, and where uh, that's, that's the whole concept. It's um, about humanity. It is humanity. Um, I am because we are, or I am because you are, right? And it's all about humanity towards towards others and a belief in the universal bond uh, of sharing that uh, connects all humanity. And, and for me, that's sort of um, the core of, of my, uh, my theology um, is about relationship. It's about building relationships with folks and um, that are not exploitive of one another uh, or exploitive of, of other folks. And I, I love what, what Charles said and um, what Jen said. Um, you know, racism is just a part of this society in which we find ourselves. It's just there. It's everywhere. Right. So right. 
let's just acknowledge that and begin to have, as you were suggesting, Scott, has to have, have the conversations, tough as they are to have, about racism in every aspect of our lives, including in the LGBTQ plus community. So I think it begins, um, you know, it begins with that. So Matt, yeah, that's what I... I was going to just jump in and add to that because I love that. First of all, you know, our name is We Thrive, which, you know, it's not I Thrive or You Thrive, it's We, which is so beautiful. And um, what you said about us culturally, I think, being connected and breaking down our racism and understanding each other more is really good. And then there's this other piece that I have to talk about as a person who identifies as white, um, and that is the GI Bill. And that is that in this country, you know, folks can do some research on it. Um, vast communities of folks of color, black and brown folks and other folks were prevented from accessing houses after World War II. And people need to really understand what that did. It meant that that huge, the millions of people stayed in rentals and, and rentals got harder and harder to get and didn't have a status credit and struggled. And so my parents were paying a few hundred dollars a month for a house, but um, other people that um, didn't look like me, their parents were paying um, you know, 600 and then 800 and then 1200 and then 2000 for a house. And so moving more and changing more and all that stuff. And so th there's this huge amount of wealth that became part of our story that um, didn't happen for other folks. And so it's just important to realize that it doesn't mean that I'm a bad person as a white person, but to recognize that this, this happened and there was some intentionality at the time about it is important. And also to try to realize that um, we have to change that going forward and figuring that out to really have equity and really have people be treated and matter equally. So, um, and then, um, you know, thinking about what we value and it all comes down to that. What do we value? Stopping and talking to someone a little longer, pausing more and just hearing more and, and remembering people. And, you know, I, I talk about the white organizing model all the time. You know, we schedule three weeks out. We do these big calendars, we email people. And if you're an indigenous person, it's like, stop by my house, knock on my door, catch me on the street. But I, I get an email. I don't know who that's from, <laughs> you know, like, is that really you there? So a lot of those things people don't know. And so if, if you're an organizer and you're doing things like that, you, you're really not helping to bring people in who uh, the best, most culturally appropriate way. But if you stop by someone's house and you show up with food when they're moving, like they're probably gonna remember that, so. Excellent yeah. point that made theirs. Go ahead, Rev. Well, I was just gonna say, I agree with you, Scott. And, and I've been suggesting that to organizations, we have to find ways other than the traditional ways of communicating with one another, the traditional ways of being together, right? And uh, I use the example all the time, of, here in, in Falmouth, you know, you can you can have a flyer. Say we were talking earlier about trying to recruit a diverse employee employee base, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if we can't find them, we can't find them. Oh my gosh, I've been hearing I that. I know, I know. Where are they? Oh, there there aren't any here. I love that quote. <laughs> like really? I see uh, them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but if you put a flyer up in. Um, you know, in, uh, in a stopping shop or Shaw's, you know, uh, you know, some some people of color might see it, but that's not the best way to reach those folks, you know. Right. Uh, so you got to find the non-traditional ways of of communicating and, and making connections with uh, with folks. Go like ahead, WhatsApp, you know, WhatsApp is a great. People don't think of advertising on WhatsApp, you know, but that's if you're in the Brazilian community, that's sort of that's how you communicate, you know. Uh, so. Yeah. Wow, this has been an incredibly robust, interesting exciting educational conversation. I really want to thank Scott and Kristen for joining us today and lending your perspective and taking the time to to help educate us in our community. And as always, thanks to Rev for, for being here and being an amazing co-host. And uh, another thank you to Deb and Alan behind the scenes at FCTV who work their magic to make this all look pretty and make it accessible to all of our viewers. So Thank you all so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to seeing you on, on the Cape at some point. Scott, I'm sure I'll see you around. Kristen, we might have to make a date, but- <laughs> I'll be back, I'll be back. <laughs> all thanks right. You, and thanks for your groundbreaking show. I mean, it really is, it is unique and we're really appreciative of that, so. Yes. Yeah, thanks guys. All right, until next time, we will see you on a future episode of The Conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you.
All right, thank you.